guess uh, some of you might have heard Dr. Mike Todd before. A couple of years back we had him, but we've got him for a couple of days. He's going to be speaking today to us, and then in the school he's going to be at Creekside in the morning, Riverside Tuesday, and then back here Wednesday for both chapel services. But uh, put your hands together and welcome Dr. Mike Todd and his lovely wife, Miss Susan's with him. today glad that you're here and uh, good to be back amen and we like the hospitality of you folks we really do no jokes not all churches like this you know I'm serious so praise the Lord I like to introduce my wife in the back here this is my wife Susan in the back and uh, she's my help me and uh, by the way she does a lot a lot of work that nobody knows about okay I'm gonna tell you that right now so I'm bragging my wife a little bit okay so anyway uh, it's good to be back Last time we did Noah and the Ark. How many of you remember that one? Noah and the Ark. Okay, the seven-foot scale model of Noah's Ark we had here. Well, uh, we're going to be doing something a little bit different today. We're going to be talking about uh, can life really exist accidentally? Well, we're going to talk about that, okay? And I hope, Lord willing, that you'll get a blessing uh, out of the message today. And before we do, let's have a word of prayer. Now, Father, I plead the blood of Christ. I pray to God should please, Lord, be glorified and honored and lifted up today. And, Lord, I pray to God that uh, if there's any unclean spirits, that you'll cast them out. And, Lord, that you'll be uh, lifted up today. And, Lord, if there's anyone here that's not saved, I pray to God that they'll trust Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Now, Father, we thank you for this day. Thank you for being good to us. And thank you for this opportunity. And I uh, pray to God you'll please bless the message now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. So here's the thing. I'm going to stand off to the side a little bit over here so that you can be able to. I don't make a good window. Okay. All right. So anyway, the thing about it is, things just right about the universe. Uh, brother, can we get these spotlights right here? Uh, can you turn those off right there? I appreciate it very much. I'm not sure if you can do that or not. Can you? Okay. These spotlights right there. Yes, sir. They're hitting me right in the eyes. Yes. Th thank you. That really helps. All right. Things just right about the universe. Now, the Bible says, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science falsely so called all right and by the way it's interesting to note 2,000 years ago Paul warned about people that are going to be preaching false science and of course today we you really have to be on guard about it amen <laughs> you see so here's the thing so we find out uh, evidence that the earth's sun system was designed by God now we find out number one we find out it far outweighs any possibility that it all happened to come together by mere chance so in other words, what the evolutionists say, that everything is accident and chance. You're an accident, they say, which God says no. <laughs> you know what I mean? You're not an accident. And by the way, let me say this. If you're just an accident, then there should be no right and wrong. There should be no morals. There should be no Ten Commandments. There should be no Bible. There should be no God. Amen? If, if you're just an accident. And that's what they're trying to get across to people today. And unfortunately, what they're trying to get across also is that there is no real reason for living, so do your own thing. It's okay to kill, murder, whatever, you know. That's the bottom line of the whole thing is, you say, well, what do you mean? Hitler believed that. Stalin believed that. Lenin believed that. Castro believed that. Come on, folks. History tells you what they believe. They were not God-fearing people. I'm going to tell you that right now. So as we look at this, notice this, we find out. Uh, the following features appear to be uh, especially and carefully designed for the unique purpose of supporting life. Now, the greenhouse effect. Uh, boy, this is going to be hard for me to read here. I didn't realize this is so wide. All right. The temperature extremes are further moderated by the water vapor and carbon dioxide in the atmosphere that produce a greenhouse effect. And, of course, you're all familiar with the greenhouse effect of the world and so forth as far as uh, safety factors that it causes in the world. Now, the Earth's axis is uh, tilts at 23 and a half degrees. This tilting combined with the Earth's uh, revolutions around the sun causes the seasons uh, which are absolutely essential for the growing of food supplies. So all these things, now watch closely. They say everything's an accident. But as you go through this, years ago they said they only need two things to be able to have life on the Earth. Only two, that's what they said. And then they said, well, we, there's five. And then they said, well, there's ten. And then they said, well, there's twenty. And then they say, well, there's 50. And then
And then they said, well, there's a hundred. Then they said, are you getting the picture? You know, so we're, we're finding out right away that things could not be by accident on this earth. They're finding out more and more and more as science uh, discovers these things, that all these things have to be there, otherwise there's no life on earth. And, and by the way, it's not just life on earth, it's life period, anywhere. Now, so as we look at this, we find out, notice this, the perfect size and mass, the, the earth uh, is needed to support life. And of course, we find out uh, these two things alone uh, and a careful balance of, uh, uh, between gravitational forces and atmospheric pressure. Now, uh, if the earth was, uh, you know, <laughs> eight, okay, thank you, brother. Yeah, I can't see that far. <laughs> All right, here we go. 800 miles uh, smaller, the Earth would uh, it would actually be reduced to an a, a, a Earth of snow and ice. In other words, if it was smaller, it would freeze. If it was getting uh, too much bigger, we got problems also. Now, if there's a variation of only 10% in size, there would be no life as we know it on this Earth. So just 10%. Now, folks... 10% might not mean much, but it means a lot when it comes to the matter of life on this earth. As we look at this, the rotation of the earth, if the earth spun faster, the centrifugal force would drive us away from the sun. And by the way, they know for a fact that there are certain things that we are right now going farther and farther away from the sun. There are uh, about 70 different evidences to show a young earth. There, no joke, you wouldn't think so, but there's 70 different evidences to show that there is a young earth. Not millions of years, but a young earth. Now, so we find out a slower spin would draw us toward uh, the sun, and of course we'd have problems. Now, the distance from the sun, the earth is positioned at just the right distance from the sun uh, so that we can receive the exact proper amount of, of heat and everything to support life. Now, this is called the Goldilocks effect. Now, we're all familiar with Goldilocks, you know, you know, oh, this is too hot, oh, this is too cold, ah, oh, this is just right. Amen? You all remember that? Okay, sure you do. Come on. All right? So we find out the other planets in our solar system are either too close to the sun or too hot or too far away from the sun, too cold to sustain life. So this is the Goldilocks effect right here. Now, this is the Earth right here. Any closer is too hot. Any farther away is too cold. Now, isn't it interesting that it happens to be just right? Think about that. It, boy, accidents are amazing. You know, <laughs> tongue-in-cheek, of course. Now, as we look at this, we find out the ozone layer, of course, the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, the ozone layer serves as a protective shield. Eight killer rays, which would cause us damage today, would destroy us all, are deflected by the ozone layer. Now, think about that. What if that ozone layer wasn't there? We wouldn't be here. That's all there is to it. So we find out if the ozone level was either larger or smaller, plant growth would be impossible, thus eliminating much of our food supply. Only 3% of the atmosphere is carbon dioxide, which is vital for plant growth and, and uh, for, a climate, uh, for climate stability. Now, dramatically changing the construct, uh, concentration of either direction would destroy all life. So the thing about it is, it's got to be just right. Now, you're going to get that over and over and over again. Everything has to be just right. Now, we find that the Bible says, for thus saith the Lord that that, that created the heavens, uh, that he himself formed the earth and made it, and he is, he informed the earth to be inhabited. Now, God says that he formed the earth to be inhabited. Not an accident, but he formed it on purpose to be inhabited. Now, notice this. Gravity, without it, there would be no tides or rainfall. Okay, Atmospheric gases would be lost. Uh, everything would fly off the planet, and the earth would not revolve around the, around the sun. So we have problems there. Now, the Earth's atmosphere serves as a protection from about uh, 50 million meteors, okay, uh, that enter the Earth's atmosphere uh, each day as at speeds of up to 30 miles per second. So now that's really, really fast. Now, we find out the marvel of air. Oxygen in the form of dioxygen. Now, it's not pure oxygen, it's dioxygen. There's a difference. Pure oxygen is extremely explosive, you know, extremely dangerous, as you all know. But dioxin, we have that in our bodies. So if we had pure oxygen in our bodies, 
get close to a match, we're gone. <laughs> you see? But not dioxygen. There's a difference. So God knew what we needed to be able to perform and to work properly so that we don't burn up. Now, notice this. We find out because of the limited chemical reactivity of dioxygen, living systems can utilize this massive energy source in a controlled and efficient manner. So isn't that amazing how that's just right again? And by the way, you'll see this over and over and over and over and over again, and the evolutionists have no answers for this. Now, we find out, notice this, everything in nature is in per perfect proportion and works perfectly. Now, we find out water, water everywhere. The earth is uniquely blessed with a bountiful supply of water, which is a key substance of, due to its remarkable and essential physical properties, H2O. And, of course, we all know the, the, the necessity of water. We need it. Without water, we're dead. Now, the oceans absorb the heat in our atmosphere uh, from the sun during uh, the day and releases it at night, stabilizing temperatures around the world, making things just right for life. Now, surely an honest and objective observer has no other recourse than to conclude that the Earth-Sun system has been carefully and intelligently designed by God for mankind. Now, as it is written, the heavens, even the heavens, are the Lord's, but the earth has he given to the children of men. There it is again. So God says two or three times in the Bible that God has made the earth for mankind on purpose. That's not an accident. We're not here as an accident. Now, atoms, electromagnetic coupling uh, of the atoms and protons and atoms, okay, uh, if it was smaller, fewer electrons would be held. If it was larger, electrons would be held too tightly to bond with other atoms. So in other words, everything must be just right dealing with atoms and all the rest. And of course, everything is made out of atoms, as you know. The chairs, you, the ceilings, everything. Everything is made out of atoms. And of course, those atoms have to be just right. Otherwise, no life on Earth. Now, watch closely. Here's another one. DNA. Anyone who believes that the DNA was, uh, you know, was accidentally created ab ran randomly without design or intelligent understanding does not understand its most basic structure. So we find out it would be like an explosion in a print shop producing an entire dictionary. And, of course, we find out that that would be impossible. Or we find out or an explosion in a junkyard would create a 747 jumbo jet. Now, we know that that's impossible. That won't work. Uh, evolutionists say, well, everything is, is possible. No, it's not. No, it's not. So here's the cockpit of the jumbo jets, tremendously intricate. Now, we find out the human DNA mo molecule is the most complex molecule in the universe. The human body has 50 trillion cells. Each cell contains 46 chromosomes. All the chromosomes in your body could fill two tablespoons. So in other words, two tablespoons in of our chromosomes could fill, uh, would be filled. Now, we find out, however, if you were to stretch out each coiled chromosome and tie them together, okay, and those two tablespoons would make five million trips from the Earth to the Moon and back, the, uh, the, uh, that uh, distance would be 240,000 miles, five million times. You talk about complex. You didn't realize you had so much in you, did you? <laughs> Okay, now, so we find out DNA and the molecules that surround it uh, form a truly superb mechanism, uh, miniaturized, marveled uh, indeed. Now, the information is so compactly stored that the amount of DNA necessary to code all the people in the world, watch this, could fit in an aspirin tablet. That's how tremendously complex it is. Now, you think that your hard drive is complex. Uh-uh. Not at all. You think your computer is complex, not even close to DNA. Now, folks, we think that the telephone systems is complex, not even close to DNA. And by the way, and when you stop and realize how tremendously complex DNA is, it's just un, un, almost unbelievable, but it's phenomenally uh, you know, complex. Now, there's no such thing as a simple cell. How many of you heard that in school? A, the simple cell, you know, 
well, there's no such thing as a simple cell. I've heard that how, how many times. Now, Dr. Carl Sagan, a well-known evolutionist, say that the least complex uh, cell has information comparable to 100 million pages of the Encyclopedia Britannica. That's the simple cell. Now, folks, let me tell you something. There's no such thing as a simple cell. Look at this cell and tell me how simple it is. Really, quickly, tell me just how simply, simple it looks to you. It doesn't look simple at all. Now, uh, evolutionists claim that life began accidentally millions of years ago. However, they cannot produce life on purpose in a laboratory. Now, if you can't do it on purpose, don't tell me it happened by an accident. Amen? You see? Now, we find out uh, Francis Crick, he's a Nobel Prize, he's an evolutionist. He said, an honest man, armed with all the knowledge available to us now, could only state that in some sense, the origin of life appears at the moment to be almost a miracle. Well, it sure was. No doubt about that. We've known that a long time, haven't we? All you have to do is read your Bible. <laughs> you find out right away. Now, the strength of gravity. If the gravitational force were altered by, well, by 0.00037 to 1%, neither our sun nor the earth or any planet or star would exist. Do you realize how phenomenally small that is? It was, if it was changed just a touch, nothing would exist. Now, in other words, we would not be having this conversation because we would not be here. So we find out Lawrence Cross said, again, I ask you, are we lucky or what? Lucky? What do you mean lucky? There's no luck involved here. It's definitely by an intelligent creator. It's like this. To have a building, you have to have a builder. To have a painting, you have to have a painter. To have a creation, you have to have a creator. Amen? You see? And so the thing is, as we look at this, to say that uh, such a thing is lucky is absolutely insane. And by the way, I believe many of these people have reprobate minds. What's reprobate? Look it up in your dictionary. You'd be surprised how, uh, the, how much it covers. But the idea of reprobate, uh, how many of you have noticed how crazy the world has gotten in the last 15, 20 years? Amen? Reprobate minds. Cuckoo. Seriously. Lester Roloff, he's an old-time preacher years ago, he said, this world is an insane asylum run by the inmates. That's what he said. And you know what? He was right. He worked with, young, he worked with youth. He worked with, uh, you know, prostitutes. He worked with drug addicts. He worked with alcoholics. He worked with all these kind of people. He says, this world is an insane asylum run by the inmates. And if anybody could say that, it would have been him. And by the way, he was saying that way back in the 80s and 70s and 60s, you see. So he saw that way back then. Now, as we look at this, notice what we find out. The Bible says, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened, Romans 121. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God, Psalm 14. And if you, have you ever come across somebody that was denied God? Sure you have. Okay, well, the Bible says he's a fool. Now, notice this. There are only four explanations for the universe existence, okay? The universe came from nothing naturally. The universe throughout eternity has always been here. The universe is only an illusion, really does not exist. The universe came into being suddenly and supernaturally. All right, explanation number one. The universe came, could not come from nothing naturally because neither matter nor energy can be created or destroyed according to the first law of thermodynamics. The universe could not be eternal for it would have devolved into a cold, dark, dead mass a long time ago, according to the second law of thermodynamics, which states that everything is running down and disintegrating. Number three, explanation number three, the universe is an illusion. So in other words, we're all insane. <laughs> okay, now that's really, really stupid. You know that, don't you? <laughs> okay, and, but the only other explanation is this. Number four, the only reasonable, logical, scriptural, and sane choice left is that the universe came into being suddenly and supernaturally. God spoke it. And it was done. So the Bible says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, Genesis 1, 1. Now, according to evolutionists, there's, uh, ev uh, the earth is no big deal uh, compared to the size of the universe. Now, basically, they say, well, the earth is no big deal. But the earth is a big deal. You won't find another earth out there, folks. When you study the solar system and all the rest of that, 
The earth is a big, big, big deal. It really is. There's nothing like it out there. Now, and anything close to like it is not like the earth. In size, I mean. Only in size. That would be about it. Now, we find out there are zillions of planets, they say, out there that are better than this one. And that's a, that doesn't sound very intelligent, does it? As we look at this, we're just one planet orbiting the sun, just another star, just another galaxy. Oh, it's, it's, we're just common. Nothing unusual about us. Well, according to Carl Sagan in his book, The Pale Blue Dot, we are totally insignificant. But Carl Sagan has a problem because Carl Sagan is a pagan. He is. Okay? Now, there are over 200 scientific reasons why living beings could not just come into existence by themselves. Did you see that? Over 200 scientific, I didn't say biblical reasons, I said scientific reasons. So science verifies the creation. Amen. That's a blessing. You've got science to back you up whether they want to believe it or not. Uh, several months ago, or maybe it was a year ago now, I came across this guy in a trailer park. We, a lot of, we traveled by trailer a lot, as you know. And, uh, of course, in this trailer campground, we, I was there, and this guy was next to me, and, and he was a biologist. And he said, uh, th he said, well, if you don't have my degree, you're stupid. That's what he said. I'm not kidding. You. Now, folks, I'm going to tell you something. I've met a lot of smart people who don't have biology degrees. Yeah, matter of fact, there's probably a few smart folks in here. <laughs> but you know what? To say someone is stupid, that's arrogant. You know, you understand what that is? That's just plain arrogant, full of pride, and he thinks everybody is beneath him, you see? Now, that's what you'll come across a lot of dealing with some of these evolutions. They're very arrogant, a lot of these guys are, and very conceited. And if you don't have their degree, they, uh, they say you're stupid. Now, so as we look at this, notice this. We find out, okay, the self-origin of life is impossible. Evolutionary theory is unworkable and is a lie. Okay, notice this. Only God could have created the plants and animals and everything that exists on, on this planet and in the universe. Sir Isaac Newton, by the way, one of the greatest scientists that have ever lived is Sir Isaac Newton. And that biology, he thinks he's the smartest Sir Isaac Newton. Man, somebody's got some real ego problems. All right? Sir Isaac Newton said, atheism is so senseless. When I look at the solar system and the earth at the right distance and the sun to receive the proper amounts of heat and light, this could just did not happen by chance. And by the way, Sir Isaac Newton is one of the greatest pioneer scientists that we know about today. Now, the Bible says, And God made the beasts of the earth after his kind, and cattle after their kind, and everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind. And God saw that it was good. Genesis 1.21. Uh, now, if the moon were closer or larger, it would pull the tides uh, over, the, over the shoreline and destroying the harbors and everything and literally flooding the plains on our earth as we know it today. If the moon was one-fifth the distance from the earth, the continents would be completely submerged by water twice a day. Now, we're talking about all of New York City totally submerged. Some of you probably watched on TV some of these end-of-the-world things, you know, and, the, and, and the, the world is being submerged. I mean, New York City is being submerged by the water and all this. Come on, some of you, come on, don't tell me you didn't see that. Okay, some of you did. All right. So anyway, and, and of course, this guy, he comes in there, Oh, rock, you know, the rock. You know, he comes there with a boat, and he saves his family and all that stuff, you know. And he's beating all the tidal waves and everything. Not a chance. <laughs> now, the thing about it is, God made our world totally different than that. Okay, thank God for that. Now, so we find out God created the moon uh, to circle around the earth at just the right distance. And what a wonderful thing. And this prevents all that uh, disaster from happening around the world. Now, our large moon acts as a barrier to protect the earth of uh, uh, many numerous, uh, it, well, in other words, from meteors and all the rest of that, okay? It creates numerous craters around the, uh, the moon, moon surface and uh, to the frequency is hit by, safe, uh, uh, hit by space objects. So in other words, many of the uh, craters that you see in the moon are, are hit by uh, meteors, okay? We find out now at the moon's south pole, the uh, Aiken Basin is the largest known crater in our solar system. It's eight miles deep and 1,500 miles across, and that's how big it would be on the United States if it hit the United States. 
Now that's one big creator. Now, the, the Bible says, And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters called he sees, and God saw that it was good, Genesis 1.10. Now, uh, a more distant moon would reduce the tidal uh, action and making the oceans more uh, sluggish and so forth. Also, we find out stagnant water would uh, endanger the marine and animal life, and it would actually reduce the oxygen content on the world also. And we receive most of our oxygen from the ocean, by the way, not from trees and plants on the earth, but mostly from the ocean. Okay, but this is more than a matter of distance, okay? The earth rotates every 24 hours. That only that not only gives us a night for rest and day for work, but it keeps the plant, planet evenly heated. So if it wasn't for that cycle, we would have problems. Also, we find out if the thickness of the Earth's uh, crust and depths of the ocean uh, uh, and the depths of the oceans were different, uh, were to increase by only a few feet, okay, or altered the absorption of free oxygen and carbon dioxide, uh, would severely, uh, severely uh, limit the plant life on this Earth, and animal life could not exist. Now, Venus, a planet similar in size, uh, rotates only once around the sun every 400, I mean, 243 days. So the rotation of the planet is very, very slow. It's not like ours. As we see here, if the Earth did the same, uh, everything would burn up or everything would freeze. But with Venus, now watch. On Venus, it snows uh, metal and rain sulfuric acid. Now, that's a wonderful place to live. <laughs> okay? Now, if the universe, was, uh, is, the universe is just right to sustain life, the electromagnetic and gravitational forces are finely tuned uh, so that our sun is stable and just the right color for our solar system. Now, there's different colors of suns out there. And some of the suns are so extremely hot and so extremely big that it would make one million of our suns could be able to fit in one of their suns. Now, so it's tremendously different as far as the suns are concerned. Now, if it was redder or bluer, photosynthesis would not be able to uh, take place on our planet and no plant life would live. Earth is like a magnetic, uh, is like a magnet, okay? And we find out the Earth's uh, solid metallic core uh, has a rotating magnetic mass of electrical conducting liquid rock called a manta, a mantle, which makes the Earth behave like a giant dynamo with strong magnetic field. Okay, this magnetic field uh, is absolutely essential for the existence of life. So here's another thing that's essential. Without it, no life. All these things that I've mentioned so far, without them, no life. Even one of them, no life. Now think about that. They've all got to be all together perfectly. Otherwise, there's no life on Earth. And we're talking 200 of them, for sure. That's what they've discovered so far. Remember, when they first talked about this, there was only two. Remember? Now, so we find out the solar wind is so powerful that it distorts the magnet uh, magnetosphere, okay, causing it to uh, face, uh, in other words, you see the distance here, uh, to uh, come get, get closer here and go farther away here. Now, so we find out, notice the complexity of our Earth. Now look at this. Our Earth is just a simple little thing. Does that look simple to you? Not at all. It doesn't look simple at all. Now, so we find out the Earth is just right to sustain life. The Bible says in Job chapter 28 that the Earth has, the air rather, has weight. And science confirms the air is 50 miles thick and perfect for our lungs. It also filters out deadly rays uh, you know, like UV light and infrared rays and gamma rays and all the rest. Now, we find out if the Earth's gravity and axial tilt and rotation period, magnetic field, and crust thickness, and uh, the nitrogen ratio, carbon dioxide, water vapor, and the ozone levels, watch this, are all just right. Now, <coughs> the atmosphere not only provides a, a breathing, but also deflects harmful space radiation and reflects so solar radiation. Also, we find out over here, all life depends on water, but if the Earth's solid material were completely smooth, the Earth would be covered by 8,500 feet of water, and you'd be under it. <laughs> okay? So thank God for the mountains and the hills and all the rest. So we find out the Bible says, the Lord, the Lord hath made the Earth by His power. He hath established the world by His wisdom. Jeremiah 51. Now our sun is just the right mass 
Uh, if there was more, there'd be too, too much, it'd be too high energy radiation. And if there's less, there would not be enough to support life. The UV radiation would also be uh, inadequate for photosynthesis and all plant life would die, okay? Our sun is a stable star. Three astro astronomers recently at least, uh, studied single stars of the same size, brightness, and composition of the sun. All of them erupt about once a century with what they call super flares, 100 million times more powerful than the one that blacked out Quebec in eight, uh, 1989. If our sun were to erupt, erupt in such a super flare, it would destroy Earth's ozone layer and kill all life. So you see, just to have a sun out there the same size as ours, or same, almost the same way, is not going to work. It has to be perfect. You see? Otherwise, no life. Now, so as we notice this, we find out uh, uh, a thousand times more asteroids would hit Earth's surface without the gravity and draw of our planet called Jupiter. Many people see Jupiter out there. You know about Jupiter. But did you know it's there for a reason? We would be bombarded by meteors all the time if it wasn't for the deflection of Jupiter's gravitational pull. Now, the odds against life on this universe are simply astounding. Okay? Sir Isaac Newton said the most beautiful system of, uh, of the sun and the planets and the comets uh, only you know, could proceed from the counsel of an, and domain of an intelligent and powerful being. In other words, he said God. Now, our galaxy is perhaps the only galaxy that has just the right conditions. Yes, even the galaxy. It's got to be just right. Otherwise, no life on the Earth. So, as we look at this, it is the right amount of elements necessary to maintain the balance of stars and planets that's required to support life. Uh, other galaxies are missing the uh, proper amount of elements. Also, stars have been known to explode into supernovas. Now, supernovas are not good things to happen. Why? Because, you see, when this happens, it permeates the whole neighborhood with deadly radiation. And, of course, we know that you cannot live on radiation. You will not become an incredible home. Amen? <laughs> okay. So we find out, notice this, an atheist, uh, Sir Fred Hoyle, and by the way, this guy was a major promoter of evolution. Get this now. And I've just uh, printed off uh, a tract uh, dealing with the fact of what the atheists themselves, the evolution itself, themselves say about evolution. You know what they say? It won't work. One atheist said this. He says, it's either God or evolution. I know evolution doesn't work, but I don't want God. Now, folks, that's, it's not a matter of science there. It's a matter of the heart. You see, there's a difference, you see. And so as we look at this, we find that he says common sense interpretation of the fact is that a super intelligence has monkeyed with physics as well as chemistry and biology and that there are no blind forces in nature. You see, that's what he says. So in other words, common sense tells him that there had to have been a creator. Now, the Bible says God made the world and all things therein. Seeing that the Lord, uh, seeing that He is the Lord of heaven and the earth, and the earth, Acts 17. Now the odds against the Earth's perfect placement are impossible. In 1966, Carl Sagan announced that there were only two important criteria for the planet to support life: the right kind of star and the planet the right distance from that star. Now and that's what Carl Sagan said back in 1966. And by the way, people have learned a lot since 1966 about science, real science. Now. Uh, he says this, as our knowledge of the universe increases, it became clear that there were far more factors necessary for life than Sagan su uh, supposed. His two perimeters grew from to 10, and then to 20, and then to 50. Uh, as factors continue to be discovered, the number of possible planets uh, that could support life hit zero. In other words, there were none out there. So we find out. In other words, the odds against uh, life on any planet in the universe supporting a life of uh, any planet supporting life okay, was including this one, was zero, okay? Today there are over 200 known perimeters ne necessary for the planet to support life. Every single one which must be perfectly met or the whole thing falls apart. So when they try to say that if you're just an accident and this is just an accident down here, it will not work scientifically. Not if a, a scientist is honest. Amen? You see? Now, I just showed you just a few things. Now, I'm not a scientist, but I can, I can do some research. So can you, you know? 
And uh, the, to say people are stupid because they don't have a degree, now that's, that's insulting to the highest degree. It really is. And uh, my father, he could make almost anything you want to name. We did not go downtown to buy a riding lawnmower. He would make one. I'm serious. You like your dad? Yeah. Yeah. You know, my dad was the same way. So anyway, uh, you know, and to s say that someone's stupid because they don't have a certain degree, that's, that's just beyond belief, you know. But that's what a lot of them do today. So anyway, we find out. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day, Genesis 131. Millions to billions of years, okay, the age of the earth has changed many times. You probably didn't know this, but they've changed the, the age of the earth numerous times in the scientific realm. However, evolutionists must have an ancient earth or their whole theory comes tumbling down. Notice this. 1830s, they said 10,000 years. 1862, 20 million. 1863, 40 million. 1899, 90 million. 1921, 1 billion. 1932, 1.6 billion. 1947, 3.35 billion. 1956, 4.5 billion. 2017, 5 billion. And so we find out, okay, thank you, honey. Uh-uh. 100,000 mi million? No, 100,000 years. 100,000 years. Uh-huh. Oh, wow. Have you ever watched some of these TV programs about nature and all the rest of that? And they talk about where there was a flood here, and there was a flood here, and there was a flood here. But they never say anything about Noah's flood. Have you ever noticed that? My wife, now we like to watch nature programs and all the rest of that, you know, historical programs, stuff like that. And we've, I've noticed that, that they sit there and they talk about this flood over here, and they talk about that flood there, and they talk about, well, you know, this, this city disappeared, that town, that continent disappeared, this place disappeared. But they never say anything about Noah's flood, you see? Well, if you read your Bible, you have a pretty good idea of what happened. Amen? <laughs> All right, so here's the thing. Now, so we find out, why do the dates keep changing? Because they got to get more and more and more years on this thing. So we find out, strange dating myth. Every system of evolution measures time by decay and a loss of content. In other words, everything is falling apart. Now, wait a minute. According to evolution, everything's supposed to be getting better and better and better and better. But their, 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 eight, their dating methods date by decay. Did you notice that? Okay, so this totally denies their own system, stating that everything's are getting better. Now, the self-origin of life is impossible. Spontaneous generation has scientifically been disproven. Okay, you cannot get life from a rock. Okay, I don't care how you look at it, you're not going to get life from a rock. Now, the remarkable balance of all living things. If birds did not eat insects, uh, to keep their population in check, okay, life would proliferate and all the uh, plants would be, you know, be gone, okay. According to evolutionists, birds did not evolve until many years after, uh, after insects, but the birds are the ones that keep the insects down. Now, wait a minute. <laughs> we got some contradictions here, don't we? So, we notice this as we see this. Instant success has to be necessary for all life forms to survive. Thousands of essential body parts and thousands of more essential chemical compounds would have to be instantly formed themselves, okay? And both male and female forms would also need to be there and be near each other in space and time for them to also work. Okay, lightning bolts only damage and kill and could not be uh, the energy source like they used to teach Yuri's uh, chemical experiment years ago, okay? Ultraviolet light reducing atmosphere would immediately kill life. Okay, scientists have no idea how to make fatty acids, or how they could make themselves. I've got a little problem here. Is this? I, I don't have a phone on. Uh-oh. Okay. <laughs> All right. Here we go. Okay. The uh, immediate com complica uh, complete duplication and reproduction of DNA, protein, enzymes, fat, cells, etc. would be needed for survival. So in other words, everything has to be there all at once. Not piece by piece by piece by piece by piece like they teach the kids in school. Now, there is not enough time and space in all the universe and all eternity to produce our present myriad of living species on this earth. Evolutionary theory is unworkable. It is a myth. It's story. And by the way, evolution is a religion, whether you know it or not. It's not science. It's a religion. 
Okay? A lot of people will, you know, they have a problem with that. But the thing is, matter of fact, that was even uh, stated in the Supreme Court years ago. Shall we find out? Evolution is religion, not a science. Only God could have created the universe and all that's in it. Amen. Praise the Lord. Now, <coughs> Oxford University professor, Dr. John Lennox, he said, the more we get to look, uh, know about our universe, and the more uh, hypotheses is that there was a creator and gains in credibility as the best explanation for how we got here. Now, this is a guy that's not saved. Okay, the belief that there are other life forms in the universe is a matter of faith. This is by a man by the name of Critton. Okay, there is not a single shred of evidence for any life forms uh, in 40 years of searching, and none have been discovered. There's absolutely no reason to maintain this belief. Design demands a designer. You can prove a designer by irreducible complexity. Okay, now how many of you, uh, this is up in Connecticut, have ever heard of the old man in the cliff? Anybody hear that, of that? Okay, several of you. Okay, now, okay, now this is an accidental rock formation here, but we've realized now that that's not an accident. You can see the design. Amen? Now, this here is just an accident. Matter of fact, it fell off uh, two or three years ago now, and it's no longer there. But we realize there's design here. You can see the difference. This is nature. This is on purpose. So, we find out the Bible says, Know ye the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us, and not we ourselves. Psalm 100, verse 3. God hath made the earth by his power. He hath established the world by his wisdom. And he has stretched out the heavens by his discretion. Jeremiah uh, chapter 10. If the Lord were to come back today, would you be ready? Let's summarize. God made the world. He owns it. He makes the rules like the Ten Commandments. He, we are guilty of breaking his rules. Have you ever taken God's name in vain? Like that one? Did that look familiar? Come on. Sure it did. How about that one? Mm -hmm. How about this one? And this one? And this one? There's another one. You see, people take the name of God in vain all the time. Until so we find out this is insulting to God. And it is. People insult God all the time. So we find out, have you ever lied? If you say no, you just lie. Okay? I had one young person, I, I said, have you always obeyed your parents? He said, yes, I've always obeyed my parents. I said, go back to number one. You know, liar, you know? Okay? So we find out, coveted. Okay, lesson in your heart. Stone something. Disobeyed your parents. Come on, have you ever disobeyed your parents? Oh, you haven't. Anybody here never disobeyed their parents? I'll talk to you out back. <laughs> okay, here it's saying, all right, committed adultery, but then God says that you've broken his laws. Now, the Bible says that whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire, Revelation 20. God says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And by the way, here's something that's a thought. How many times have you ever heard someone say, well, I'm as good as so-and-so down the street? Ever hear that? Sure. Guess what? The Bible says all have sinned and what? Come short of the what? What is the glory of God? Jesus Christ is the glory of God. Amen? Sure. Now, Jesus Christ, now, did anybody in here say, Jesus, I'm just as good and righteous and holy and pure and perfect as you are? Well, no. Not, that's, that's just makes you cringe, doesn't it? Sure. Well, people, you'd have to say that to be that good to be able to get to heaven. Now, it's not comparing yourself with the preacher or this preacher or the deacons or whatever, anybody else. It's comparing yourself with the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, when you talk to people about Christ, show them the standard, and the standard is Jesus Christ. Not me, nobody else in here, but the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. That's what they have to see. If they don't see that, then they're not going to really understand fully. And so we find out, notice this, the wages of sin is death. The Bible says this, one day you're going to die. And the thing is, is that these gravestones are all different sizes and shapes and colors, as you see. And we find out, when the death angel comes your way, how will it be with you? Will you be ready? And there's only one of two answers. It's either yes or no. Okay? Hell is an awful place. People don't get out of there. They burn forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. And that's why we need to be concerned as Christians to be concerned about people going there. That's why... Hey, I'm 73 years old. I'm still trying to do something for God. Amen? You know? And the thing about it is, I don't care what your age is, or even if you're in bed, you can still pray for people. Amen? You might be handicapped, but you can still pray for people. 
you can, some of you can still give. Some of you can do something for missions. Some of you can, whatever you can do. Hey, you can do something. Amen. You see? And that's what God takes into account. He knows whether you're faithful in those things or not. Now we find out. Notice this. The creator of the universe cares about you. And that's what got my attention. God, why would you love me? Why would you care for me? Also, we find out Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins. Also, he was buried and rose again the third day. I don't serve a dead God. I serve a living one. Amen? Amen? Amen. That's why we celebrate Easter. Okay, we find out the Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Uh, 2 Peter 3. Jesus said, Come unto me, that ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Jesus said, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. For were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. Heaven is a wonderful place, full of glory and grace. Heaven is a wonderful place. Oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. No more sin, no more crying, no more dying, no more hospitals, no more cancer, no more gray hair, you know, no more wrinkles. Amen. You know, amen. No more glasses. <laughs> hallelujah. And by the way, you might not say hallelujah down there, but when you get a new glorified body, you will. Now, where will you spend eternity? Will it be heaven or hell? My friend, salvation is only two, one of two choices. Either accept Jesus Christ as Savior or reject him, one or the other. It's up to you. Preacher, if you will please take a look. Choice is yours. You're going to accept Jesus or reject Jesus. I hope each and every one of you will, will accept him as your Lord and Savior because that's what will determine your eternal destiny as far as w whether you go to heaven or hell. It's whether or not you trusted Jesus as your Savior and Lord. We have a, a, a three or four young ladies that have trusted Jesus as their Savior and Lord. They're getting ready to be baptized in a minute. While I finish talking, ladies, if you'd like to go ahead and get your girls ready, and if there's any young men, but the, go ahead and dress here, come around this side, and we're going to enter through this side. The Baptist room, we're going to come out this way. So make sure you have a towel there in the kitchen area for them when they come down the steps in a minute. But uh, while they're getting ready and while the team is uh, taking the screen down, if y'all want to go ahead and do that screen, y'all can be doing that. So it might need some help lowering the screen. But uh, maybe you're here today and uh, God's been talking to you. Uh, one of the things that we do at Countryside is we help try to help you establish a strong faith. And not just a faith in anything, but a faith in what Jesus did over 2,000 years ago for, for you and me. Maybe you're here today and, and uh, you, you've been thinking about it and you've been uh, contemplating making that decision to follow Jesus. I want you to, to uh, pray to the Lord right now. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. And if you're here today and uh, you haven't trusted him and you want to, now's a good time. These little girls and young ladies are going to uh, testify with their baptism one day that they've, they've trusted Jesus, but maybe you're here and you haven't yet, and you'd like to. We, we believe that the Word of God teaches that uh, as the, the sinner in Luke cried out to God, be, God be merciful to me, a sinner, that a person like you and me, we need to call out to God for salvation and ask Him for that. And maybe you're here today and you'd like to do that. If you, if you really would, if you'd like to believe in Him today, pray, pray a prayer like I'm going to pray right now. Pray this prayer. Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. And I can't save myself. The Lord, you you came. The preacher told us today, and I've heard it before, that you came and died on the cross for my sins. And I believe that. And I want eternal life when I die. So I, I trust you today, and I accept you as my Lord and my Savior. And, and I'll do my best to live for you on planet Earth as long as I have breath. Thank you, Lord, for coming into my life today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Now, if you did that, need to tell somebody today okay and if you did that you might want to get baptized like these young ladies are going to get baptized because this is your their first act of telling somebody about christ and witnessing is a public baptism like this and what is what it is it's a picture of the the death of jesus and he was buried and he came back from the dead the third day so it's a picture of the death burial and resurrection of christ so we're going to go get back and get ready and we'll be back with you in just a minute if you want to go up and take pictures on the stage, uh, families, you can walk right up the steps here and get near that speaker. And as your child is getting baptized, you're welcome to stand up there and take pictures. Family, if you'd like to move to the front, if you're here today visiting and you have 
people getting baptized, come on up and fill these front pews up. You're welcome to come.